I'm Jeremy Hoffman. I'm the climate and earth scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia. Uh, I also enjoy a relationship with the VCU Center for Environmental Studies. And you can find me on Twitter. Most of the time I tweet about things like climate and earth science. Uh, and so tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a little bit, about the earth science of the movie Interstellar. And, um, you know, Interstellar has the word interstellar in it. And I guess, hey, at least it's not water world. I know that's throwing shade on Waterworld, but um, if you want me to talk about Waterworld, you know, I can come hang out with you sometime. We can talk about Waterworld. But tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Interstellar. And um, spoiler alert, I'm about to reveal the plot line of the movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's been out for several years, so uh, it's kind of uh, old news here now. But Interstellar's premises. Um, the major cr crops, for some reason, is okra um, and wheat have both gone extinct. And uh, the only thing that's really um, lasting now is corn. And it's due to this thing that, that we'll describe as called the blight. Um, it's never really described, but we can kind of think of it as like a crop disease or a pest. Uh, but like I said, it's not really ever truly explained throughout the, the, the plot of the movie. So we have to kind of make some, make some assu assumptions about what that truly is. And the kind of the reason why this whole people go to space and um, go see a black hole is because if it's not corrected, this blight will eventually lead to the total disruption of plant life, which then will cause us to eventually not be able to breathe anymore because there's not any oxygen being, um, being produced. So it's basically a depletion of atmospheric oxygen is a major plot point in the movie. So I have a question, and I want to dig into how plausible these two situations truly are, given our current understanding of science. Um, and it really, I want to start with this first one about uh, atmospheric oxygen, because it's very rarely that I get to talk about the atmosphere, and, and especially a gas other than CO2, which you can see here in this graphic from several years ago, was only 0.03% of the atmosphere. Now it's actually 0.04% of the atmosphere, or 400 parts per million. Hasn't been that way for millions of years. But I want to talk about this pink slice of the pie, uh, oxygen, O2. We need it to survive. Um, it's about 20, 21% of the atmosphere. Um, the major part of our atmosphere is actually nitrogen. And uh, um, my question is how much 20% of the atmosphere being oxygen doesn't tell us at all about how, how much it is in human consumption. Like if you were to shut off all the other things that produce or use oxygen, how long could we be able to breathe it? So that starts with, and I was in my office the other day thinking like, okay, how do I even answer this question? First of all, you need to know the mass of the atmosphere. Uh, in 2005, um, atmospheric scientists from the National Center for Atmospheric Research determined that it's something like 5.148 times 10 to the 21st grams. That's how heavy it is. Um, it's exceptionally massive given, uh, it's like, um, I don't even know how to really compare that uh, in a way, but I can say that 21% of that by mass is oxygen, which means that's somewhere on the order of 1.03 times 10 to the 21st grams of oxygen. And, and Justin will be happy to know that's about one fifth the mass of Saturn's moon Hyperion. So I can talk about space too, Justin. Um, so, okay, th that doesn't answer a question. We can know how much there is, right? That's, a, that's, if you're like balancing your checkbook, that's how much is in savings, okay? That much. Uh, one fifth the mass of Hyperion Saturn's moon. But how much do we actually use? Now this is a whole nother kind of avenue of things. How much does a human breathe every single day? It turns out, that turns out to be about 550 liters of pure O2 every single day. Your lung capacity is somewhere between four and six liters, or, uh, or you breathe that in an hour, um, or you breathe something like 11,000 liters of, of air per day. Um, and if that's 20% oxygen, then it would be actually much more than that. It'd be something like 2,000 liters. But it turns out your lungs only use about 5% of what you breathe in. So we don't breathe out pure CO2. We actually breathe out something that's a combination of CO2 and, and oxygen. So we actually only end up using about 550 liters of oxygen every single day. Now, 
using the molar, basically atmospheric chemistry, go back to chemistry class, that's uh, about a like 1.43 grams per liter of oxygen is actually, um, that's like the mass of a liter of oxygen. So that means like, over the course of the day, we use almost a kilogram, 786 grams of oxygen every single day, every single one of them. Now this, you use more if you work out. This is like somebody that doesn't make their breath go faster at all throughout the day. So this is a, assuming a very sedentary lifestyle or not really going out and doing any um, hard physical labor. If there are 7.7 .7 billion people as of March 2019 on our planet, that means that we're using about 6 times 10 to the 12th grams every single day. That is 2.2 um, .2 times 10 to, the 10th, 10 to the 15th grams per year, or about as much uh, mass as a teaspoon of a neutron star. So, Justin, there's another proof that I can talk about space, okay? Um, but anyway, so we have how much humans use every single, every single year, and we have how much is in the atmosphere. So now we can do a very simple equation to figure out how long we have if we were to shut off oxygen sources. But this is going to assume that we don't have any animals. All the animals are gone. And this, the reason I'm assuming that is what, when you watch the movie, see if you can see any animals in the movie. If you spot an animal, tell me where it is in the time frame of the movie. Now also, there are other sources in sinks of oxygen. And, uh, you know, when you turn on your car and you burn gasoline, that's oxidizing carbon uh, that's in your, in, your, in your engine. So you're actually using oxygen when, whenever we burn something. So actually, humans have decreased the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere ourselves through human activities. Um, but also like phytoplankton in the ocean. They, the ocean breathes as well. It's not just land plants. So I'm assuming that none of that exists. Um, and on top of that, a constant human population. So I just have to be honest with about what my assumptions are. But if we have that much in the air, so that's how much is in the sky, and that's how much uh, humans use every single year, that means we have about 1,300 years of oxygen. Yay! Yeah, but it's, it, it gets worse because actually humans need at least 16% oxygen in the air to to live. <laughs> so that means of that amount, it's not that much that we have to work with, it's actually 5 times 10 to the 19th grams. That's 21% to 16%. We only have about 5% of the atmospheric oxygen to work with. So with 7 billion people, we only have 60 years of oxygen. But to answer more, to, to think more deeply as you go through the movie, are there 7 billion people in the movie in, in, in Interstellar? No. Turns out, if you catch certain plot points, it seems like about a, a, a tenfold decrease in human population, which would mean that this is something more like 600 years. But then, when if there's 600 years, is it really that big of a plot point? If you have 600 years, that's, not, that's kind of a long time. So, I don't know, you take that as you will, but it's not as, it doesn't seem as urgent as I kind of thought it was when I first watched it. Um, but anyway, uh, really quickly, I want to talk a little bit about the blight. You'll see them burning crops. Um, turns out in April 2015, an article literally called out an interstellar-like blight could ravage Earth's wheat. Now, that the paper um, is actually a little bit more nuanced than the <laughs> popular science article, uh, but nonetheless, elevated CO2 in the atmosphere um, makes this certain wheat virus more virulent. So it's easier to pass around, it's a stronger virus. Um, but one thing that these papers and anything that you see when these big, big uh, articles come out about the future, we don't know a lot about how technology is gonna continue to revolutionize, science and technology will continue to revolutionize our lives. Let me show you one thing that gives me um, hope. Here's time on the bottom from 1866 to the rough present and the average corn yield in the United States per hectare. So in the same amount of space, we have, you know, basically five times as much yield per hectare of space. And when you look globally, um, the amount of land that we have to use in order to achieve the amount of food we need has been steadily decreasing. So when we 
basically have to predict from this spot where we, if you were to be asking us back in 1980 how much space we would need and how much food we would need, we wouldn't have been able to tell you a really good, you know, really good uh, clear vision of what it would look like only 20 years later or 30 years later. So when you see these big claims about what the future might be, remember that we have the ability as scientific society to use technology and make decisions to better um, the situation that might be at hand. And um, particularly when it has to come to the climate. So all of these things that I just showed you have occurred in a relatively stable climate, but now that is changing. Uh, here in Richmond, we could see a quadrupling or an eight times as many days above 95 degrees by the end of the century. What can we do about that? Um, well, here's an example uh, of what that might mean for specifically Virginia. Julie Shortridge at the Virginia Tech um, basically looked at yields in corn and soybeans. The green line here is assuming no climate change. We stop the, the climate change train in its tracks today. We get this increasing corn yields per acre. That's good. That's what we expect. Technology doing its thing. But when you add in low emissions of, of carbon, even if we like kind of turn uh, our emissions of heat trapping gases a little bit down, and then here's a high emission scenario in red, we could actually see losses to our state economy based on climate change. Now, this isn't a surprise to people that work in the economics of climate change, but that is a very real impact on the livelihood of several people in the state of Virginia. Now, how do we solve that? The biggest thing is reducing the amount of heat trapping gases that we're putting into the atmosphere. 80% of that, these two pies show you breakdowns of US greenhouse gas emissions. 80% of what we put into the air is carbon dioxide. And most of that comes from three places. The type of power that we're using, the type of transportation that we take, and this big meat, like, there's no real face to industry. <laughs> but. Um, you're going to hear a lot about f ways that we can address these three main sources of heat trapping gases to the atmosphere uh, over the next, you know, years, decades. And realistically, these are the places that we need to spend a lot of time thinking about what are the technologies, what's the science that we can use to revolutionize this part of our economy. So it's a hopeful story because we don't have to leave Earth. The point of Interstellar is that you have to leave to fix it. We have the ability and the scientific knowledge to say there's a lot of things we can do right now to avoid that. There's a lot of, a lot of different things that we can be doing. Um, the main part of which being reducing heat trapping gases emissions to the atmosphere. Um, as far as the crop disease goes, they are risks. Um, but we have technological advances that we can avoid them. We'd definitely go hungry, I think, before we started to lose the ability to breathe. Um, so that's, that's, that's comforting. Uh, <laughs> and uh, most importantly, I want you to enjoy my colleague, Justin Bartel. He's going to be talking to you about space. And thank you so much for listening to me talk about the Earth science of interstellar. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, paying attention to Earth science is pretty important, but as we all know, this is a space movie. So, um, I've got good news for you. It's a good story. Okay, I don't mean that exactly the way you may be thinking. I'll get to that. Uh, first, uh, I should tell you that even people that worked on the movie, this is Dr. Kip Thorne, recently won a Nobel Prize in physics for working on gravitational waves, also served as a science advisor and executive producer on the movie. He claims that everything you're about to see was built from the ground up on the science behind it. And yeah, they did pretty good. Who am I to argue with science consultant, executive producer, and Nobel laureate Kip Thorne? Uh, his work on the movie did result in a couple of technical papers as well as a popular level book. Um, if you really want to dive into any of the space science that you're about to see, uh, I can help you track down those sources, but that book is really easy uh, to find. The title is easy to remember, The Science of Interstellar. Um, I thought I would just kind of focus on three parts. There's 
too much that we see in space if we tell you about all of it. So three quick lessons for you. First, uh, just a little primer on how to get into space and uh, how to explore space. Uh, then a couple of advanced courses for you, uh, relativity and black holes, and then wormhole construction. It might be even higher level, I don't know. Um, at this point, you've already heard a little bit of the lead up, the premise that sets up the journey into space. So this is your last chance. Um, if you haven't seen the movie in the last five years, I mean, you really have yourself to blame. But uh, you know, earmuffs right now, I am going to completely ruin the whole thing. All right, here we go. So, um, Space Flight 101. This is probably the part I have, honestly, the most trouble with. Um, we're going to see some crazy things with uh, wormholes and black holes, but this is the stuff that I just don't get. Uh, we've never sent people through wormholes to explore another galaxy before, so the best comparison I have is about 50 years ago, the Apollo program, right? We sent people to the moon. At the height of the Apollo program, NASA and its contractors had some 400,000 people working on the project. It's also about the number of people that attended Woodstock, so uh, that's what we're seeing there. It's contemporary, it's the right number of people at the same period of time. As Jeremy's already pointed out, the population is probably sagging on Earth and in the United States at this time, so NASA probably just doesn't have that much of a workforce to draw from. They probably don't have the money to pay for these missions either. At the peak of the Apollo program, NASA got more than 4% of the US federal budget every year, for a couple of years anyway. Now it's about half a percent. If uh, the country is in such dire straits that, uh, you know, they shut down things like higher education, you'll see in the movie that only certain people get to go on to college, uh, you know, NASA probably doesn't have a whole lot of money to work with. They have literally moved underground, and metaphorically too, so I'm not even in the federal budget at all. Um, then there's the literal state that they're in, their location on the Earth. On this map, you are seeing uh, rocket launch pads around the world. The ones marked in green are the ones we have used to send spacecraft beyond Earth orbit, either to the moon or another planet. The ones marked in red are just for orbital launches. Now, uh, you might notice a few similarities with most of those sites. A lot of them are on coastlines. And uh, that's because, uh, well, the Earth, if you look down on it from above the North Pole, it spins counterclockwise. See, Jeremy, I can talk about the Earth, too. Uh, man, uh, so what you want to do is you want to send your rocket, you want to shoot your rocket to the east, and then you take advantage of the Earth's rotation, and you get a little boost from our home planet. Uh, so for the most part, when we launch rockets into space, they're going to travel generally in an easterly direction. You can go north and south, too, and take no penalty. Going to the west, we've got to fight against the Earth, so we don't do that. Uh, so uh, that's why NASA today is in places like, uh, you know, Florida. You can go to the east there. You can go uh, south from California there. Um, so where is NASA and Interstellar? They've set up in Colorado. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, you know, they're working with an old uh, NORAD base. Uh, they got a little home under a mountain. That's kind of cool. Uh, but they do launch the rockets from there, uh, presumably. So uh, they're going to be shooting to the east. That's going to go over the uh, eastern half of the United States. Okay, not as many people around, but you still have to worry about uh, you know those rockets coming down and landing on Earth. We've got to devote a lot of uh, land to growing the crops that people need to survive. There's a real picture from China. Now, not all of their launch pads are close to the coast, and sometimes pieces of their rockets do land in inhabited areas. So, you know, NASA tries to avoid that today. I'm not sure why they'd stop. So, for me, this is the hard part to understand in the movie. So if you're with me so far, the rest will be a breeze. Let's move on to relativity and black holes. This is the giant uh, black hole you're going to see during the movie. It is a super massive black hole. I don't know exactly how big it is, but I can tell you a couple things about it. First, this is probably the most accurate black hole uh, that's ever been put into a movie. Probably the most accurate one you've seen. Not the most accurate visualization overall. A few people have been doing better. Um, we're seeing here various simulations from the last couple of decades. 
Not that different. The, the big difference between these is that in, in all these others, let's use this one's a little bit bigger, um, this disk is a, is a flat disk that's going around the black hole. One side of it appears a little bit brighter. That's because everyone is assuming that these black holes are spinning. So you're going to get some, some Doppler effects going on, uh, and uh, that'll make one side of the disk appear a little bit brighter. But overall, you know, they did pretty good with their black hole. I won't complain about the visuals too much, but I will try to explain them to you just a little bit more. Uh, so uh, again, we're looking down at this black hole. It's got a flat disk of material going around it. Uh, this time I've tilted it just a little bit. So we're looking more down uh, towards the pole of this black hole. I'm going to simplify things for you just a little bit. I'm going to color code everything so you can keep track of what's what. Uh, the blue stuff here a little bit closer to us, the yellow stuff a little bit farther away. Now we're just going to get the same perspective that uh, you get during the movie. We're going to rotate around this. You'll see that ring that forms is all the yellow stuff. It's all the stuff that's farther away from us. Uh, we see that, you know, that blue stuff, the part of the disk that's in front of us, that, that just stays a regular flat disk. It's the stuff on the other side of the black hole that turns into that ring. Now that happens because of gravitational lensing. Uh, that is a result of Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's about 100 years old, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. But you've probably seen pictures like this before. A planet or a star sitting on that flat grid that, uh, that represents the fabric of space-time. So when we think about gravity, it's not just a force that objects have. It's this bending, this little dent that, uh, in this case, Earth is, is causing on that sheet. So if you imagine something coming along close to Earth, it cannot roll straight along that grid. It's going to have to curve here because of the dent that Earth has put on it. And uh, we see that not just with objects. We see that with light. Um, this is a recent observation from the Hubble Space Telescope. They saw light from a distant star bending because of a white dwarf. And of course, black holes do that to the extreme. They won't just deflect light a little bit. Um, as we saw with the black hole, they can bend light in all directions around themselves uh, and make that ring. So uh, that's what's going on there. Visuals, pretty accurate. Uh, we're also going to see during the movie some planets going around a black hole. Um, a black hole is not just a big vacuum cleaner. It doesn't just suck everything in. It's just something with really strong gravity. So if you're at the right distance and you're moving the right speed, you can orbit around a black hole. These are stars that we've uh, observed around the supermassive black hole, the center of our galaxy. So that's not too much of a problem. Um, let's start talking about the problems, though. Uh, there are some problems with black holes. Oh, nobody else had one of those chairs? You do. All right. So you can confirm for me that well, you've got to be a little bit careful with them, right? When you sit down, uh, you know, your hands can slip between the, uh, the PVC uh, straps there. You've got to make sure both ends are latched in place. Otherwise, when you sit down, you know, your feet might be too high, your head might fall back. You know, the different uh, parts of your body can have very different experiences when you sit in that chair, right? Okay, that's well, funny to me. Um, now, <laughs> the same thing can happen to a black hole. If you get too close to a black hole, its gravity increases so quickly that different parts of your body can experience very different things. Kind of the, the classic picture is you're going towards a black hole, say feet first, and when you get close, the gravity at your feet is strong enough compared to the gravity you feel at your head. Your whole body gets stretched out, leads to one of the best words in all of science, spaghettification. Your body gets stretched out like a noodle, right? And then eventually the black hole pulls you apart entirely. It's pretty unpleasant. That seems really bad for Cooper. He's going to go into the black hole at the end of the movie, right? That's okay, though, because I've already said we assume all these black holes are spinning, and that means everything's going to be just fine. There's a paper from, uh, from just last year examining what happens to some common spacecraft materials when you get them close to a black hole, if you're going to go into the black hole. Uh, some of the details on this chart are, you know, for next year's relativity class, but uh, we're tracking here strain. That is the, the physical deformation that, that a substance will experience when it is is exposed to a force. And as we get closer and closer to the black hole here along the horizontal axis, I mean, the numbers get bigger, but the labels over here, it's like plus or minus three. 
that's not the end of the world. And this becomes more of an engineering problem to figure out how you can keep things together with these forces. Um, and you know, you can get inside a black hole. That's okay. Now, could you actually do it? Well, this is where I actually get to explain the uh, title of the talk. Uh, if you read this paper carefully, well, already there's some interesting words here in the title. Rapidly rotating, that seems special. Kerr black hole, yeah, that's special too. And if you read through the conclusion, uh, there are a whole bunch of things they aren't even considering. So. When I say the interstellar depicts an ideal future, I'm not saying it's an ideal vision of the future that we should strive for, let the blight come and leave Earth. Um, I'm saying it's an ideal future more like, well, if you had to spend a night with a black hole, what kind of black hole would it be? What's your ideal black hole? It's more of a dating game ideal kind of thing, so that's what we're looking at here. Now, it's not all a walk on the beach. There are still some bad effects from these black holes. Um, one effect, the, the effect they'll have on time is depicted uh, pretty, pretty uh, accurately in the movie. They visit a planet where, uh, what is it, one hour on the planet is uh, supposed to be, what, seven years back on Earth. And that's an effect called time dilation, and it does happen, especially if you're moving really fast. So they set up this planet that was really close to the black hole, which means that planet has to be moving really fast, pretty close to the speed of light. And so that is going to cause that time dilation. Now, apparently the, the numbers they use in the movie, the, the one hour to seven years, that was, that was set in stone by the, uh, uh, the Nolan brothers. So uh, there's nothing that uh, you know, Kip Thorne could say to make him change that number. So he had to do a little bit of extra math and see if he could make it work. And it does work if your black hole is really unusual. So all black holes spin, sure. And there is a certain rotation speed where a black hole will actually pull itself apart. So never mind the spaghettification. A black hole can tear itself apart. Um, and that's if uh, you know, it reaches this critical rotation rate. As far as we can tell, real black holes, they get to about 99.8% of that speed. So pretty close, but they aren't there. If you do all the math, I'll save you from that. Uh, Gargantua, the supermassive black hole in the movie, it's got to be spinning just a little bit faster. Those two numbers may not seem extremely different to you, but uh, try moving the decimal point just before the X. Then we're talking about the difference between a three-digit number and a nine-digit number. If you put a dollar sign out front, then it really makes a big impact. So, um, you know, that, that is a significant difference. And there are probably no black holes like this. Uh, the black hole that Cooper safely travels into probably doesn't exist. But it looks nice. So, uh, now, our last quick lesson here about that wormhole that they fly into. Um, wormholes are kind of strange things. They're going to connect different parts of the universe. They do a decent enough explanation in the movie where they poke a pencil between a piece of paper, so I won't uh, talk about it too much, but uh, this is the type of drawing that you might see in a technical paper, and that's, uh, in fact, that's from a paper co-authored by this guy. You probably remember him. Uh, in that same paper, he says, wormholes, probably impossible to construct, unless you can manipulate space on the quantum level, the smallest scales. All right, sounds pretty good so far. And then they'll close themselves immediately, unless you have plenty of exotic matter with negative gravity, whatever that is, to prop them open. Okay, not so bad. Uh, and um, maybe we can make it all work if our universe is embedded in something called the bulk with extra dimensions. Okay, so we don't know, but not everybody is so skeptical. There's a paper from uh, just last year that took a more optimistic tone. Uh, Kip Thorne is saying essentially these wormholes we can travel through, impossible, even if they are a special solution to the equations. Uh, this recent paper said, oh, no, 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 it's fine. Uh, you do a few unit conversions and you get a pretty simple result. I've never seen math with commas and semicolons, but um, you know, if, if that says we can actually travel through a wormhole, then I'm willing to give all of Interstellar a pass. Well, except for that thing where they, uh, you know, 
launch from Colorado. All right, um, I guess there's the old-fashioned way to get a wormhole. You just take two black holes that are connected to each other. Uh, just a dramatic illustration of what would happen if you did that. In the movie, the, uh, the wormhole is at the orbit of Saturn. And based on the size of the wormhole, we can say that the black hole needed to form the opening of the wormhole in the neighborhood of 10 times the mass of the sun. So if you put something 10 times the mass of the sun at Saturn, does anybody like Saturn? I'm sorry, it's gonna get pulled apart by that uh, black hole, it's gone. Uh, now, the, the black hole is also going to become the dominant source of gravity in the solar system. So it's not gonna be the sun and the planets going around the black hole, it's going to be more or less the sun going around that black hole. It might work out if the orbits are circular like that, but they probably won't be. And then this wormhole is likely to throw off the stability of the entire solar system. And no matter how much oxygen we have, no matter whether we can fly through the wormhole or not, that wormhole spells bad news for the solar system. So I think the only thing I can really do is give you one closing piece of advice. If you remember just one thing from all of this, I know we got into a lot and I was probably talking pretty fast. Um, there's only one thing that you should know about going in space and trying to use wormholes and black holes to save your society. Anderson, put us back on course. Warp three. Yes, sir, warp three. And Anderson, if you encounter any holes, steer clear. <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs>